be here in this uh, seminar series. Thanks for the invitation also. Um, I will share my screen. I will try to do it here. Start my presentation. Oh, I'm not sure if this is the correct one. Could you see my presentation before? Uh, yes, we can see. Oh, oh, so I will, oh, I will do it saw, again. And then we lost it. We... Oh, OK, yeah. I didn't see that the, the, the line around it, but now I can see it, actually. Yeah, yes. we can see it very well. Nice. OK, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be here and be able to present my work, uh, which I did during the past uh, about three years in the Nolan Lab at Stanford. And uh, what, what we try to do is we try to predict uh, cancer immunotherapy response um, based on tissue architecture in tumors before even the, the, the patients are treated with immunotherapy. So this is really important because um, immunotherapies are very expensive. They cost about $250,000 a year for one patient. And um, they're also very uh, dangerous actually because they can have a lot of uh, uh, toxic side effects. They can uh, result in um, uh, diarrhea and um, toxicity to the liver, toxicity to the brain, et cetera, et cetera. So it would be very important to have predictive markers to select patients um, before immunotherapy starts. Because in total, about 70%, even though immunotherapies have resulted in a lot of success, especially in metast metastatic melanoma, et cetera, uh, overall, 70% of all the patients do not respond to immunotherapy. And this is a, a, a reason why we are interested in better selecting the patients before we start immunotherapy. And we think that besides counting the cell types in a tissue and besides uh, seeing what the frequencies of the different cell types are, the spatial architecture of a tissue is really important and we would like to see how the tissue actually is composed and which cells sit next to which cells and how this hierarchy of uh, intercellular relationships leads to the organization of the tissue. And we think that there is a lot of information to be found in this organization and hierarchy of the architecture that we can use um, to predict immunotherapy response and also to understand better cancer biology. So now I would like to give you a short introduction into the tumor uh, immune microenvironment, one of my uh, fields of research. Then I would like to show you uh, what codex actually is, how we use it, and how we um, used it in FFPE tissue. Then I would like to uh, give you some results in two different projects that I worked on during my time in the Nolan lab. One is in colorectal cancer. This is just more a proof of principle study which was recently accepted for publication in Cell. And the other one is a project that is still ongoing with a good friend of mine, Darcy Phillips, in the lab. She's a dermatologist. And we started to look at uh, immunotherapy response in cutaneous T-cell control. So the tumor microenvironment and the tumor immune microenvironment is a highly complex ecosystem consisting of tumor cells and structural components such as extracellular matrix, fibroblasts, blood vessels, Etc., and it has a huge range of different immune cell types, usually in most tumors, uh, which consist of lymphocyte subsets, myeloid cells, etc. And these cell types all communicate with each other in the tumor immune microenvironment either by secreting soluble factors such as metabolites, uh, cytokines, chemokines, etc., but also by direct cell cell contact. Now, there is a, there's a broad range of questions we can uh, ask about the tumor immune microenvironment, and we need better tools to understand how the architecture influences its function. So we need to know how the, ex the uh, tumor microenvironment is exactly assembled. We want to know each position of each single cell to get an idea of how the architecture is uh, composed. And this will then lead to insights into the function of the ITME over time. We want to know how this uh, architecture also uh, affects outcomes and survival in cancer. 
And of course, most importantly, we want to understand how we can better manipulate uh, the cells in the tumor microenvironment to improve immunotherapy. Now, there have been a lot of developments recently with uh, single cell RNA sequencing and also cytoph like mass cytometry to get an idea of what is act actually there in the tumor microenvironment, which cell types at which frequencies, etc. But these technologies have a significant drawbacks. Firstly, they need single cells, which needs the tissue to be uh, uh, grinded down into a single cell suspension. And it is well known that many cell populations get lost during this process, especially fibroblastic populations, which are very important in cancer. Secondly, uh, we lose the spatial uh, composition, and that's actually what we are most interested in. So there are now new technologies that uh, already were presented in this seminar series, some of them uh, such as mass cytometry imaging, um, maybe, and also codex. So I would like to show you how Codex works. This was developed in the Nolan lab. There are several uh, similar technologies like Vimeo Saber, which was developed in Peng Li's lab. So this works basically the following way. We have an antibody that is coupled covalently to a an oligonucleotide, and each uh, antibody has its own oligo uh, specific sequence. And we visualize these antibodies using a complementary a uh, fluorophore labeled oligo, which is added to the tissue after the antibodies have been bound. And then we can image the antibody in the tissue. This is a schematic of how this works. This is a section of the tissue here, colon cancer. We add a, a cocktail of antibodies, and then we render these antibodies visible using the uh, complementary fluorophore labeled oligos. We do usually three at a time. We can do more or less, depending on the microscope setting. And then we image the region, uh, tissue region of interest, whereas uh, these oligos are highlighted. And then we gently strip off uh, the uh, oligos with the fluorophores, but the antibodies stay in the tissue. So it's not a harsh stripping, which leads to tissue degradation, but it's a very gentle stripping. And then we do the next round and over and over and over again, imaging the same region, using Hux nuclear staining as a reference marker for tissue alignment. And this is done uh, repeatedly until we have all the uh, antibodies imaged. Currently, we have an upper limit of 57 antibodies to, uh, due to the number of oligos, but we're already developing uh, new barcodes so that we can get more 200, 200 and more uh, antibodies. This is the codex workflow. In, initially, we, we create our antibody panels, and this is a very time-consuming process because each antibody has to be tested individually, then we have to test them in the panel, et cetera. <clears throat> but when, whenever we have our panel of 55 to 57 antibodies, we then stay in our tissue. We run the multi-cycle reaction using this fluidics device and the microscope, and then we get to the raw data, the images. So this is about one to two terabyte of images, depending on how big the region is. And these images are then computationally processed. We align them, we can then make composite images, we uh, can segment out the single cells, we can uh, calculate the, the marker expression per cell and also its spatial position. And from there on, we can then use a flow cytometry type of analyses. We can do clustering, we can map the cells on the tissue, and we can do uh, spatial analysis. This is uh, uh, some uh, images from the Nolan lab where we have different uh, stages of evolution of codex devices. This is uh, the prototype uh, designed by Yuri Goldseff and Nikolai Samusik. It's basically an autosampler with a pump and a valve, and it brings in the reagents into the microscope. It, it looks very messy, but it works very well. All these, uh, all these uh, machines are still used. Then this is the early access version, and this is the commercial product that is now for sale from Akoya. Uh, when I joined the Nolan Lab, as uh, Professor Koshkun pointed out, um, they were only doing codex in fresh frozen tissue and never, it never worked in the FFP tissue. So we then uh, came up with the idea or the need to do this in FFP because I'm a pathologist uh, by training. I wanted to look at FFP tissue. FFP stands for uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded and it's the most abundant tissue in the world. 
basically all the archives in the pathology institutes consist of FFP tissue. So to get access to these clinical cohorts, we developed a, a protocol to stain um, codex uh, staining with uh, FFP tissue, and we also changed the oligo sequences such that they were compatible with the type of tissue. And in a huge effort, together with Darcy Phillips in the lab, we validated about 130 antibodies, uh, which we can now use in um, an FFP codex, uh, mostly immune markers, as you can see here, also checkpoints, etc. <laughs> but also a broad range of non-immune tissue-specific uh, markers, as shown here. For example, pancreatic markers. Um, we have some uh, chemokine receptors, etc. Um, this is a tissue microarray that I created before I joined the Nolan lab, especially uh, exactly to do this. So I took a bunch of different cancers, uh, about 60 cancers and normal tissues. I assembled a tissue microarray and you can see here all these different tissues which were stained simultaneously and run in the same run. And I will now go through um, the markers. It will, it will be a short video. Oops, sorry. Here. So it will flip through the markers and you can basically see what kind of uh, staining pattern we see. And we could use this tissue microarray very well to validate these markers and see that they are specific for certain types of tissues, but not for others and certain cells and not for other cells. So this multi-tumor tissue microarray uh, took about 36 hours to complete the run. And um, we had 66 tissues in this case, times 57 markers, which results in like 3,700 readouts. And one important advantage that I didn't mention yet of Codex is that we can do um, hematoxylin eosin staining of our tissue in the same run. So at the end of the run, we can do HME staining, and that's what you see here. And we can actually map our cells also onto the HME tissue, which is very useful for morphological correlation, especially to me as a pathologist. I always want to see the HME because sometimes with clustering, there can be some issues, and these can be resolved using the morphology in HME. Now, I would like to show you some, some images from this run. We have here a breast lobular cancer, which has this uh, infiltrating pattern of single cells that are uh, lined up in these, uh, in these cords. And we can see that these cells express GATA3 in the nuclei. This is a specific breast cancer marker. We can see that some of them are proliferating, like this one, for example. And we have also some other markers. This is only showing seven markers on top of each other, we have 50 more markers that are not shown here. And this is a gastric cancer here. Um, you can see the infiltrating tumor cells here in these uh, cords of tumor that are positive for cytokeratin, EPCAM, and MAF1, which is a, a typical marker here, uh, especially in the apical part of the cancer cells. And in the stroma, we can see some CD7 positive T cells. Some of them express PD1, uh, as shown in pink here, and CD163 positive macrophages and some vessels uh, in blue. This is one of my favorite images. This is a pleural mesothelioma, which is a malignant tumor of the chest wall. It is induced by asbestos, and it's a very deadly disease. Basically, it's a death sentence. There is no curative therapy. Um, there's only one thing you can do is basically early surgery, but most often the tumor is detected in a very late stage and the patients will ultimately uh, die of this disease in about 12 months. So what we, what we found using Codex here, you can see the tumor cells that are infiltrating into this soft tissue of the chest. Uh, we have an immune reaction going on. There are some CD45 positive immune cells. And what we could see interestingly, was that the, the, the mesothelioma cells, which are cytokinin 7 and protoplanin positive, as shown here, also express VISTA. And this was not shown uh, up to then. So we thought VISTA could be a biomarker for mesothelioma. And we didn't follow up on this, but we thought it was interesting. And then half a year later, there was a big paper in Cancer Discovery where they actually pinpointed to this 
um, they found that using, using um, uh, RNA and DNA uh, sequencing, they found that VISTA is overexpressed in the mesothelioma, and they had a follow-up study even showing more cases in a pathology journal, modern pathology with the same group. So it's really powerful to have all these markers together because then we can find unexpected marker combinations as for example, VISTA, which is a T-cell checkpoint expressed in a cancer. So now I'd like to show you some uh, data in the colorectal cancer project that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, we were interested in seeing the, tissue, the tumor microenvironment in different uh, types of cancer. And one of them is colorectal cancer. It's uh, the second most uh, common cancer in men and women. And um, uh, there is a peculiar architecture of the tumor microenvironment in some of these cancers. So we basically took the uh, most extreme forms of this tumor microenvironment. We had on one hand the uh, patients who have a Crohn's-like reaction. This has nothing to do with the Crohn's disease. This is just called like this because these patients have a lot of tertiary lymphoid structures. They have a lot of follicles at the invasive front of the cancer. So they have a lot of T cells and they have well-formed follicles and a nice immune reaction. On the other hand, we have a patient group that only has a diffuse inflammation and no follicles. And these patients do very bad, whereas these patients have a good survival, even though these patients were matched for stage and, and everything else. So we, we took uh, advanced stage cases uh, with stage three and four. And you can see here in this survival curve that the CLR patients, which are the patients with the follicles, they have about 75% long-term survival. Whereas the diffuse inflammatory patients, they do much worse and they have only 25% long-term survival. Even though the tumor, the TNM stage, the tumor node metastasis stage was exactly the same for both patients. So we created tissue microarrays from these tumors. And the advantage of this next generation tissue microarray uh, is that we can drill very precisely the structures that we want all digitized. So we have digital slides, we have digital annotation, etc. We can draw a, a region in the computer and the, the, the robot will drill exactly there. So we could actually drill out these follicles, as you can see here, for these patients. And we had a four regions per patient at the tumor invasive front, which resulted in 140 total cores. So this, this was a highly selected collective. As you can see here, we started off with 715 patients, then we took only the ones with um, advanced stage, and then we removed everyone that had uh, preoperative chemotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. So we ended up with 35 patients, 17 CLR and 18 DA. We then performed COVEX using a broad panel of antibodies against adaptive immune cells, innate immune cells. We also had a lot of functional markers, such as PD-1, PD-1, etc. And we had uh, structural markers such as SMA, GFAP, and neuroendocrine markers. Here's a short video to show you how this looks like uh, close up. We can uh, see the different markers when it flips through these two cases. Again, this is the patient with the follicle. I always bring the same example. Here is the follicle with CD20. And we can see on the other side, we can see the diffuse inflammatory patient. I will always show the same two pores to have a good contrast between them. Here we can see a lot of macrophages with uh, CD163 and CD68 expression as shown here, for example. And um, we can clearly see that these pores are different uh, in the staining. That's an HME staining again. We then looked at uh, the cells. We always do that uh, to get a good idea of how, how good the markers work. And you can see here, uh, again, the CD20 uh, with the B cell follicle. And we even have a good staining for uh, Fox B3, for example, here in red, we can see the regulatory T cells as shown in red and uh, co-staining with CD4. And we can see in this case that we have a lot of macrophages as well as regulatory T cells in this case. 
We then clustered the cell types, and this is uh, just a simplified version of the clustering with only nine uh, clusters shown. We have uh, pulled together lots of cells, but we had a total of 28 clusters, which were morphologically verified on the tissue. And uh, you can see that these clusters align very well with, with the uh, actual staining, at least here where we can see the morphology very well. This is minimal spanning tree showing uh, the clusters in the two patient groups. And on the first uh, glimpse of this, we can actually see that there is not much difference when it comes to number of cells. So each, each node here is a, is, a, is a cluster and the size of the node tells you how many cells are in this cluster. And when we compare these two, um, these two minimal spanning trees, we don't see many differences. We had some significant differences for sure in the B cells where we can see a lot of B cells here and less B cells here and some myeloid clusters which were bigger here, for example, the granular sites. But mostly the clusters meaning the cell type frequencies were similar um, between these two groups and there was only a few handful of clusters that had significant different uh, numbers of cells. You can see here in the coloring that the PD-1 expression, for example, and we did this for all the markers, the PD-1 expression is slightly higher in some of the T-cell clusters in the diffuse patients. So we thought, uh, we reasoned that when we don't see uh, big differences in the numbers of cells, that actually the architecture is more important. And we already knew that the architecture of the follicle is important somehow uh, to have the better survival in, in the patients with the follicles. But what, what about non-follicular parts of the immune reaction? What about those? So how do we do this? How do we look at, at the spatial architecture of the tumor? And this is actually a, a, a nice illustration because we can do, we can look at different levels of the tissue simultaneously. We can look at the cell types, which are shown here, and we can look at the cellular neighborhoods, which are regions of the tissue within which cell has, uh, within which each cell has a similar surrounding. So when we look at these uh, coupled views from these two different panels, and a cellular neighborhood is, is similar to a neighborhood in a city. For example, the business district. When we have the business district and I go into the business district, everything around me looks the same, right? So this is, this is basically how we, how we look at cellular neighborhoods. So we can look how the cell type composition and the cellular neighborhoods in a tissue change in two different patient groups or over time in a disease. And we can look at how these behaviors of these different views are coupled and using this uh, technology, we can then look at coupled modules of tissue behavior, which is basically how cellular neighborhood modules interact with cell type modules to form tissue modules. It's similar to gen uh, genetics, right? Where we have gene, genes and other genes that regulate uh, other gene expression. So we have modules of genes that are co-regulated or, or anti-regulated, and these again regulate different genes. So we look at this in this way. Then we can look at uh, how uh, a neighborhood has, uh, for example, enrichment of a cell type that expresses a certain marker, for example, PD-1 or IPOS. So we can look at the functional state of this neighborhood with, with regard to a cell type, and we can then look into how this affects survival, for example. And one, one other thing we can do is we can look at inferred communication between neighborhoods. For example, we have a, a range of cell types in neighborhood green, and we have a range of cell types in neighborhood blue, and how are these correlated? So if one cell goes up here and one cell goes down here, and this is significantly correlated or anti-correlated, we can infer communication. Something is going on that couples these two neighborhoods. And we can look at all of this simultaneously using a technology called a canonical uh, CCA, canonical, uh, <coughs> canonical uh, correlation analysis, and then we can build intercellular inter neighborhood communication networks. <coughs> 
So how did we do this for the cellular neighborhoods? We, uh, Graham Barlow and Solu Bata, two very talented uh, PhD students in the lab, they developed an algorithm to basically compute the, the, the frequency of each, uh, of each uh, cell and its nine nearest neighbors, so a patch of 10 cells, uh, which is called a window, and then compute, uh, for each cell, compute its window. And then these windows are clustered together and we see, for example, windows two, five, and six, they have a lot of yellow cells here, so it's close to the follicle. And we call this neighborhood then the follicle neighborhood, which is resulting here. And we can then also map this onto the tissue. We can see what is this, for example. So this very well aligns with the follicle. So um, I'm showing here again the neighborhoods. We already saw this picture. And this is now for all the patients done. Um, we clustered the windows and we looked at the enrichment of cell types within different neighborhoods. For example, here we can see um, the follicle, which has an enrichment of B cells and CD4 T cells here. And it's very nicely aligns with the follicle as seen in hematoxyl and eosin staining morphologically. We found that around the follicle there is a T cell enriched neighborhood. And we also saw, for example, granulocyte enriched neighborhoods, which, which was more abundant in, uh, in the diffuse patient here. So now we were interested in how frequent these neighborhoods are be between the patient groups. And we didn't see many differences there. Of course, again, the neighborhood with the follicle was much more frequent in the follicle patients compared to the diffuse patients, but all the other neighborhoods were similar in distribution. So there was no significant difference in the amount of each neighborhood. So we then wondered whether we can find some other uh, differences between these patients uh, without looking at the follicle. So we removed the follicle neighborhood here. And we were uh, looking into how the cell types and the cellular neighborhoods and their coupling um, basically uh, create the architecture of the tissue and create the tissue models. This was done by Salil Bata in the lab. He's a mathematician and he came up with the idea of using uh, Tucker tensor decomposition, which is basically a, a higher order generalization of PCA. And for each patient, we created a data matrix consisting of neighborhoods and cell types. So this was then uh, compiled into a tensor, which is basically a three-dimensional data frame. And for each group, we had a tensor. And these tensors were then decomposed using tensor decomposition algorithm. And this resulted in a visualized output. So the question is now, how can we interpret this visualized output? And I already started explaining this a little bit before. So we can, see, uh, we can see the composition of the tissue and the building of the tissue as um, an, an organization of, uh, of recruitment and localization of cells. So we can think of a neighborhood being a space where a cell type is recruited into, for example, by a chemokine, which is the recruitment factor. And we can think of a cell as being a unit as is recruited into a space by having uh, expressed a cellular localization factor, which could be a chemokine receptor, but it could be something else as well, uh, an integrin or something like this. So then when we look at this, uh, at these different um, combinations of cells in different neighborhoods, for example, here in this case, we have a single cell type recruited into multiple neighborhoods. So the, the green cell is recruited into blue neighborhood and into red neighborhood. Or we have multiple cell types recruited into multiple neighborhoods. And if we look at these interactions between neighborhoods and cell types across all patients, we can infer how the tissue is made up. And this is represented here as a graph where we have tissue modules, uh, which are made up out of cellular neighborhood modules built from different uh, cellular neighborhoods and cell type modules. And these cell type modules and cell neighborhood modules interact to different strengths. So I would now like to show you the output of this analysis. And this output actually informed our subsequent analyses um, to look deeper into the tissue. 
we have here the output for the patients with the follicles, and we see two tissue modules. Tissue module one is uh, what we call the immune compartment. And this compartment is um, composed mostly of immune neighborhoods with uh, interacting, immune neighborhood modules interacting with immune cell type modules, as shown here. What we also saw is that um, there was an interesting finding. The macrophage enriched neighborhood, which is in purple here, was in a different module than the T cell enriched neighborhood. And this is interesting because macrophages in the tumor are usually immunosuppressive. They are often derived from myeloid derived suppressor cells. And we, we saw that here they were uh, in separate modules. On the other hand, we had a cell um, uh, a tissue module that was composed mainly of tumor neighborhood interacting with tumor cells modules. And there was also a stromal module, which was in both tissues. So we had a separation of the tumor from the immune system here. Now, I would like to show you the result for the diffuse patients, which is obviously um, different. And here we had a module of tumor cells and immune cells. So a tumor and immune compartment. And we saw that the tumor was actually within the immune system. It was somehow inter interfering with the immune system. That's what we inferred from this analysis. Okay. In addition, we saw that the T cell module was together with the macrophages. So this implies somehow that the macrophages are acting on the T cells or vice versa. We don't really know uh, for sure, but it's an interesting observation. On the other hand, we had here a module that mostly was defined by the granulocyte compartment, which was a granulocyte in rich neighborhood. And this module then informed our subsequent analysis for these patient groups. So we, we could really clearly show here, based on tissue analysis, and if we hadn't known this, we could still end up with the, um, with the notion that these two patient groups are highly different, even though we've removed the follicle from this analysis, uh, still the outside of the follicle and the region around it is completely different in the diffuse patients versus the, the organized in the interaction patients. We were also interested in looking at, into functional markers, as I said before. We had a range of functional markers in the, in the panel and we were mostly interested in in um, ICOS, which is an immune activation marker, CHI-67, which is a marker of proliferation, and PD-1, which is a so-called immune uh, exhaustion marker. And we, we looked at these uh, markers on different cell types. For example, here, FOXP3 positive for LTL2 cell, uh, which has expressed uh, ICOS. ICOS on FOXP3 cells actually increases their suppressive function. So it's, it's different from the CD4 T cells where it increases their uh, tumor, tumoricidal function. Then we had a CD8 T cell with a chi 67 so a proliferating CD8 T cell, and here an example of a PD-1 positive CD4 T cell. And we looked at all the different neighborhoods, uh, we looked at them for enrichment of these cell types in one versus the other group. So we can see here uh, in red, in this heat map, you can see that some of these cell types are higher in diffuse patients in a certain neighborhood, and some are higher in uh, the follicle patients. For example, here, proliferating CD4 T cells are more enriched in neighborhood three in the follicle patients, whereas PD-1 positive CD4 T cells are more enriched in neighborhood nine, which is the renal site neighborhood, in CD4 um, in, in diffuse patients. So we focused on this uh, because we had the idea that something is going on with this special neighborhood in the diffuse patients. And when we looked at this cell type more closely and we looked at survival analysis based on cell type density of this CD4 P1 positive T cell, we could see that uh, patients with a higher number of this, um, of this cell type in this neighborhood, they had a better survival than patients who had a very low number which uh, these patients actually died very early after diagnosis. So we can actually see that uh, the, the enrichment of certain type cell types in certain defined uh, areas of the tissue, even though the whole um, 
the number of these cells is the same in both patient groups and even overall uh, in, the, in the tumor, but the specific enrichment in certain areas has prognostic impact. We also performed a CCA, canonical correlation analysis, and this is more to look at um, <laughs> cellular uh, or neighborhood communication, which we infer uh, as from upregulated uh, or numbers of cells in one neighborhood correlating with numbers of cells in another neighborhood. So for example, we saw in, in, the, in the CLR patients, in the follicle patients, that the KI67, Ki so proliferating CD8 plus a T cell frequency was not correlated with the regulatory T cell frequency in, in neighborhood macrophage neighborhood four. Whereas in the diffuse patients, there was an inverse correlation. So the more regulatory T cells we had in this neighborhood, the less proliferating T cells we had in neighborhood one. And we can do this for all cell types across all neighborhoods simultaneously. And then we can build a canonical correlation which we can then visualize as a, as a graph. And this is shown here. So we have uh, the communication network between these different neighborhoods. And you can see the healthy communication network here in the CLR patients, which have a good immune response. We can see that uh, the follicle is somehow coordinating the immune response with, uh, with um, connections to uh, the T cell rich and the macrophage rich neighborhood, which then route through the tumor boundary into the tumor. That's what, what, we, what we think is happening. Whereas here in the, in, the, in the patients who have a bad immune response, we have uh, the, the granulocyte rich neighborhood coming in, playing uh, into the, the tumor and into the tumor boundary, which is neighborhood six. The follicle is basically inexistent, not connected to anything. And we have a, a rewiring of a neighborhood one uh, and four and six. So the strength between neighborhood four and six is much higher. So this is, uh, this is basically what we did in this paper, uh, which was recently accepted in Cell. And it's, it's a good proof of principle that we can do lots of different analyses using the spatial architecture of the tissue. Uh, what, what uh, another development we're, we're working on uh, currently is coupling this, uh, this um, analysis with uh, RNA sequencing data. And this is a project together with Ro Wang in the neighboring lab, where we use uh, either bulk RNA-seq data from sorted cell populations or single cell RNA-seq data to basically project uh, onto the codex data. So we take, for example, macrophage, and then we, we look where these macrophages are in the codex data, and then we create these projected spatial transcriptomes, which can then be used to model cytokine and chemokine diffusion gradients, for example. This is all just modeling. And we, we, we wanted to do this as a proof of principle. And we, again, used the colorectal cancer data set. And as you can see here in the, in the follicle patient, again, the same picture as always before, we can see that, for example, interleukin-6 is nicely uh, confined to the follicle where we have uh, B cells and then there are some, some um, TNF and IL-1, uh, which are also nicely in, uh, present in a kind of a gradient outside. And uh, you can see that this looks completely different in the diffuse patients. We have a soup of things. We don't really see nice organization. And there's a lot of uh, IL-1 receptor there probably in the myeloid cells. So I think this is also a very nice tool to get an idea of what is going on in the tissue. Now I would like to show you uh, very briefly um, the, the skin project, which was done uh, together with Darcy Phillips and Yang Kim. She has a huge uh, database of skin uh, cancers um, in Stanford. And one of her uh, main fields of interest is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. which is a CD4 positive malignancy of the skin. And it is a, a, a tumor of CD4 T cells that basically home to the skin and create these patches. It's very hard to diagnose as a pathologist because it looks like an inflammation. And it, it takes on average six years from the first presentation to a final diagnosis. So it's, it's very hard to diagnose correctly. And um, it's a, a chronic disease. It doesn't go away usually. It progresses into a patch stage, 
uh, plaque stage, sorry, from patch to plaque, where the tumors get thicker, and then in the end, we end up with a tumor stage. And here, these patients, about 50% of all patients um, progress to the tumor stage, and the survival here is very, very poor. Um, they, these patients do very badly, and they, they need different therapies, but none of the therapies are really working or curative. So these patients usually die within five years. So we see here uh, this tissue, and we see that there is a lot of pink, which is CD163 positive macrophages, and this is a really interesting cell type, uh, M2-like macrophages, and they, they play a very important role in this disease. And in, 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 in total, uh, the, the tumor microenvironment is a key predictor of disease progression and also therapy response. So we were very uh, happy to have uh, access to a cohort of patients who were treated with pembrolizumab, which is an anti-PD-1 antibody. And we had access to 14 patients. We had seven responders and seven non-responders in this cohort. There were a total of 24 patients treated, but we only had uh, sufficient tissue from 14 patients to do this analysis. We had biopsies before and after treatment, two biopsies before treatment and two biopsies after treatment from each patient. And using these biopsies, we created a tissue microarray, as you can see here. And um, this, this, this cohort was recently published in JCO by Kuda Dao Sen Yong Kim. And uh, as you can see in this survival graph, the responders did much better than the non-responders uh, to the PD-1 therapy. We created a, uh, a panel for this, uh, for this codex run consisting of 54 markers. <laughs> and importantly, using this panel, we were actually the first to be able to um, confidentially, uh, co confidently identify uh, CD4 tumor cells in the tissue at the signal cell level. Because we could call them out based on a differential marker expression profile, basically, <coughs> excuse me, it's very important to know that um, these uh, CD4 T cell lymphomas, they lose several T cell markers, uh, most importantly CD7. So we could see that CD7 was uh, strongly downregulated in tumor cells and they overexpressed CD25 and also CHI67 because they were more proliferative than the, the active T cells. So using this, uh, this combination of markers, we were able to call out CD4 malignant T cells from the reactive infiltrating CD4 T cells, which is very important in this project. Here's a short video to show you some, some data uh, for a, a, non a responder and a non-responder. We can clearly see that there are different um, uh, expression levels of these markers in these patients. Um, importantly, here in the responders, we also drilled with the tissue microarray, or we drilled the most infiltrated regions in the, in the tissue, so where there was still a, a little bit of residual tumor to have like a good comparison to the non-responders, because if there's no infiltrate uh, after treatment, we cannot do any research with, with these cells. We clustered them and then we, we found uh, uh, 21 clusters after merging and, and curating them manually. Uh, there was a huge cluster of tumor cells, of course, and intraepithelial tumor cells, which we kept, kept separate. Um, there were B cells, CD8 and CD4 T cells, regulatory T cells. There was a myeloid cluster with uh, Langerhan cells, macrophage subtypes, dendritic cells, etc. And then we had a, an auxiliary cluster with stroma, epithelium, et cetera. The plasma cells usually uh, are depicted on the minimal spanning too close to these clusters because they express CD138, which is also expressed in the epithelium. Um, when we looked at the numbers of these clusters and we mapped them back to the tissue to have a good, good correlation, and we saw that this, this works well. And when we looked at the numbers of these clusters uh, in, in the patient groups, so we had four groups of patients, pre and post treatment, four groups of samples. I mean, we uh, had responders and non-responders pre-treatment and responders and non-responders post-treatment. And when we looked at the different cell types in these patients, we didn't see any differences uh, on the, uh, in the numbers of cells in the tissue. And this was, uh, this was a confirmation of the previous study from Kudadaus et al. Uh, 2019 in JCO, 
they did uh, cytoff of the blood, they did immunosochemistry of the tissue of the lesions, and they did not see any significant differences in these different cell types. Even though they used a more simple um, approach, they did not see any significant differences in numbers of cells. We then dug, dug in uh, a little bit deeper and we could see some significant differences in uh, very rare subsets of cells like icons positive CD4 T cells. Uh, we could see that the responders had higher numbers of these cells than the non-responders. We had IDO, IDO positive CD8 T cells, which are kind of immunosuppressive CD8 T cells. It's, it's a rare subtype. IDO is an immunosuppressive enzyme. And ICOS positive T Rex, which are more immunosuppressive T Rex than the non ICOS positive ones, which were higher in the non responders. But these frequencies were so low that we were not very confident with this data because there was only a very few cells per tissue. So we, we again, we again uh, reasoned that the architecture itself is more important than the numbers. And uh, we again performed neighborhood analysis. And as you can see here, it's uh, nicely aligning with, with the HNE. We can see the epithelium here in the HNE. And we can see that the epithelium uh, neighborhood nicely aligns with that. And the epithelium neighborhood consists of epithelial cells and intraepithelial tumor cells mostly. And, but then we could also see that in the HE, it's very hard to see any structure in, in here because it's all blue cells. We don't really know what they are. But we can see when we have the cell types and the neighborhoods that there are structures emerging in this infiltrate. For example, we could see a, a neighborhood comes enriched in tumor cells and dendritic cells, which is in purple. And surrounding this neighborhood, in yellow, we had a neighborhood consisting of tumor cells and CD4, enriched in tumor cells and CD4 T cells. And this, there was a pattern that always the, the purple neighborhood was inside the yellow neighborhood or something. We also saw a, a regulatory T cell enriched neighborhood in pink. And uh, I want to go into more detail here about this, these neighborhoods. Because when we looked at the frequencies of these neighborhoods in, uh, in the patient groups, we could see that. Um, in the responders, we had an increase in the tumor cell and dendritic cell neighborhood and the tumor cell CD4 T cell neighborhood. So we thought that there might be something ongoing with antigen presentation in the responders after uh, initiation of therapy that doesn't, doesn't uh, take place in the non responders because there was no significant difference here as well as here. However, in uh, the non-responders, we saw even before treatment that they had more of this regulatory T cell in this neighborhood. And this was a stable over treatment and didn't change after treatment. So we really, um, we really saw this uh, in this neighborhood. And again, I would like to stress that the numbers of regulatory T cells, their, their absolute frequencies in the tissues was the same in all patient groups. So it was really how these the, the, the most important thing was how these um, regulatory T cells were spatially arranged with each other that basically made this difference. So, for example, we could use this uh, regulatory T cell enriched neighborhood um, as a proxy or as a predictive marker for immunotherapy response. And if a patient has a lot of this regulatory T cell enriched neighborhood, it could be that this uh, patient is not going to respond to immunotherapy. And we also simplified this, uh, this whole thing down to uh, a spatial, uh, a spatial um, score, basically. We created a spatial score. I didn't include this uh, graph here because it's still, it's very confidential and um, it's unpublished yet. But um, we, we found that the arrangement of three different cell types and their spatial uh, distances are actually predictive of the therapy response. And this is something very simple that can be done on a platform such as Vectra, which only has seven markers. And uh, we, we are now uh, in the process of confirming this in a bigger code. Uh, finally, we also performed uh, RNA sequencing. We looked at differentially expressed genes that we did um, in step sections of the, of the, of the uh, tissue microarray. And we laser capture micro dissected the course, and then we did RNA sequencing, and we found that some interferon gamma and activation markers were upregulated in the responders, 
uh, and especially we're interested in CXCL13, a chemokine that uh, directs CD4 T cell migration. Whereas uh, some, uh, some suppressive markers like CD39 and Fitches were upregulated in the non responders. And we're now currently performing cyber sort analysis to better uh, understand where are these, where these, um, these markers and these uh, genes are coming from. Cyber sort is basically can be used to infer, um, infer uh, cell specific RNA expression in bulk uh, RNA seq data. So uh, I would like to come to the end and give you some take home messages. I think uh, FP Codex is very, very useful uh, for clinical uh, studies. We can uh, look at uh, tissues uh, from the pathology archive. We can study the immune tumor microenvironment and we can look at uh, tissues over time. For example, we can look at archival tissues from, uh, from 10 years ago and we can also um, look at uh, uh, tissue microarrays, which is very powerful to have a high throughput. Uh, it, I think it's very useful to do biomarker discovery because we have many, many markers simultaneously and we can look at unexpected marker co combinations. And we can uh, then further continue if we want to do uh, large scale validation, we can uh, narrow our marker panel down to about seven markers and then do uh, full slide image uh, scanning. Uh, with hundreds or even thousands of patients using Vector. Um, in the, the CRC and CTCL uh, codex, I think I could convince you that uh, CD4 T cells uh, that are PD1 positive play a key role. And we also see this in the, in the CTCL uh, tumors and also regulatory T cells. And uh, CD4 T cells, I think, in tumor immunology have been long. Uh, underestimated because everybody was talking about CD8s because CD8s are cytotoxic cells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there was a recent paper, and this this notion of cytotoxic CD4 T cells has been around for a while. But there was recently a high-profile paper in Cell uh, where they showed that there is a cytotoxic CD4 T cell in bladder cancer, and it's very important. So I think we will hear a lot of. Uh, a lot of stuff going on about cytotoxic CD4 T cells in the near future. Neighborhoods are important. Uh, the spatial architecture is important. And this uh, is, uh, has more information than just the numbers of cells. And of course, uh, we want to validate the, some of the findings functionally, for example, CXCL13, how it acts on the CD4 T cells, etc. So I would like to thank everybody for being here in this seminar and I think uh, I would like to thank Ahmed, Professor Kochshun for organizing this seminar together with his colleagues. It's a very great opportunity to have all these different um, speakers uh, speaking and uh, I think it's a great platform. Of course I would like to thank all the non lab members, especially the people who are working on Codex, mostly uh, Gary Nolan, of course, the boss, and then Yuri Goldseth, he's a senior scientist. He basically uh, co-developed Codex. Darcy Phillips, she's a uh, dermatology instructor. I worked closely with her on the dermatology project. And then Salil and Graham, who are brilliant PhD students who developed lots of the computation. And then, of course, all the collaborators in the lab, uh, all the collaborators outside of the lab, the founders, and um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, I'm soon moving into my own uh, faculty position in probably in Germany uh, in the next few months. And uh, um, I'm looking, of course, for motivated postdocs and PhD students to join my lab. I will be doing lots of codex in the future and I'm happy to collaborate with all you guys. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask any questions right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian for this great talk. Uh, it was great to see two different disease models benefiting from codex analysis. So I think to make this interactive, um, I'd suggest you guys unmute and ask your questions to Christian, if you have them, of course. Yeah, I have a question. So a uh, question, a uh, great talk, and I really like your analysis. And I was wondering, with so many marker in codex, and when you're analyzing the different Sales importance in predicting 
there will be a multiple testing issue, right? Especially when you only have 14 patients in your second project. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I had trouble uh, hearing you. Oh yeah, so um, I mean, for you have many cell types, right? And when you're um, trying to analyze which cell is a indicator of response, you will test most many of those cells and then there will have a multiple testing issue? Yes, 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 correct. So I, I know that there is this multiple hypothesis testing issues and overfitting of the data issues. The problem is with this disease, with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, it's a very rare disease and it's very hard to get good cohorts. It's very, very difficult. So it's actually quite a big cohort for this rare disease, uh, 24 patients. So we're actually expanding now on this, on this. So we had 14 initial patients, but we're now doing Vectra on the whole cohort of 24 patients to like mitigate some of these issues. But I know it's, 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 this is just how it is in this, in this kind of disease. It's, this is very rare and yeah, this is a problem, of course. We want to do bigger cohorts in the future, for sure. I see, that's great. And a quick second question. And do you see like heterogeneity in those uh, samples? For example, oh, the absolutely. T yeah, so for example, the T-rig is kind of indicator in predicting and can you say like heterogeneity, for example, for responder has less, very small number of T-rig? No, the, the regulatory T-cells themselves, they, the, the, the numbers of them, they are similar between all the patient groups. It's only how they are spatially arranged that is significantly different, but they, the, the numbers are, are similar, yeah. I see. And uh, there was a lot of heterogeneity when it comes to functional markers, especially. I can maybe show, maybe I have this here. Yeah, I have this here. So as you see in this graph, um, we can see, I don't see my mouse right now. Oh, here it is. So what, what we can see here is that uh, in, one of the, uh, in one of the patients who didn't respond to the therapy, um, there was a highly upregulation, a high upregulation of all these checkpoint and, and, and uh, co-stimulatory molecules in all the cells, basically in all the tumor cells. So this was really striking to us. And this patient was actually a rapid progressor. So this patient basically rapidly progressed upon administration of PD-1 inhibitor. And it is, it is known that a T-cell lymphoma is actually quite risky to, to treat with a PD-1 inhibitor because PD-1 is, is a break on T cells, right? So if, yeah. you, if you loosen the break with a PD-1 inhibitor and some of these tumors are actually PD-1 positive, then it could actually accelerate the tumor as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but that, that's some kind of heterogeneity we saw, we saw in this patient group, yeah. Okay, that's great, thank you. Hi, this is uh, Juan, uh, Juan Jin Ho from Johns Hopkins. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk and just really gorgeous figures as well. Um, one of the questions that I had was, um, you know, there are different ages of these FFPE blocks that, you know, we deal with as you try to pull them into TMA. You know, I, I do agree that TMA is probably the most effective way to do something like this. But you know, all these blocks are from different ages and whatnot and different fixation, things like that. Do you have correct within your analysis for potential batch effects related to you know, how old the FFPEs are or you know, these kind of technical batches, batch yeah. effects that, that could be? Yeah, used? that's a very good question. So um, we see these batch effects, of course, we see them in, in the tissues, but uh, it doesn't really matter because what we do is we overcluster very much. Uh, doing the clustering, we overcluster to about 250 clusters or 200 clusters. And then these different clusters in different batches get pulled out apart. And then we manually merge them back together. So we basically verify each cluster uh, morphologically on the tissue. So that's where we see these batch effects. But these batch effects are then corrected for using the manual. Um, Duration of the clusters, so I don't think it's a big deal here. I see this so is the clustering part. I I I, um, I can see what you're saying. As far as the functional marker expression, for example, do you also correct for those uh, in any way? Like 
PD-1 expression level in a particular cell type cluster? For we example? don't really, that, that's, I, I would really recommend not to, or it's, it's a very difficult thing to do like levels of, of things. I don't think we can do this like in facts where we can say like, this is three logs higher than, than baseline or something like that. I think we can just say yes or no. I don't okay. think we should we should look for uh, levels of expression in this kind of tissue because uh, immunochemistry is, is basically semi-quantitative, right? It's just yes or no, more or less. You cannot really say, okay, some, some pathologists, they do say like one plus, two plus, three plus, but then, yeah, it's, it's very, very rough. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that personally. I would just say, okay, I see it, it's expressed, or I don't see it, it's, it's negative. But of course, if, if it's negative, it could well be that it's just, uh, it's just because of bad fixation. That's true. So in, we, we, we have very good standards of fixation in Switzerland. Everything is, is basically um, for biobanking. Everything is, uh, is timed and like all the organs are freshly delivered to the hospital. So the pathologist immediately sections them and fixes them. So we have very good quality, but in other places it could be difficult because sometimes uh, organs are sitting on a bench after surgery for two hours and then they're fixed with like only a tenth of the formalin that is needed to properly fix them, et cetera, et cetera. So skin is not an issue because skin biopsies get immediately put, usually they do the biopsy and then they put it immediately into formalin and it's only a small piece of tissue. So I think for biopsies in general, it's much, it's much less of a problem. There, the problem could be overfixation, which is more than 72 hours. This can also lead to artifacts. But in general, uh, for, for large organs, it could, be, it could be an issue. And this needs to be carefully evaluated. Yes. OK, thank you. That makes perfect sense. Thanks a lot. Any more questions? So in the chat, we had the discussion about TMA and the big tissue sample, but I guess you already answered it, right? TMA versus the big. I, I, I didn't see the chat, let me pull it off. Yeah, so if you read the quick discussion, I think that's relevant to some of your explanation, but still it's good to read. Let me see, um, okay. Oh yeah, there was one question about the, fee the field of view for a TMA. Yes, so that's a very good question. It's of course always a, a question of uh, throughput because a, a codex experiment can take a very long time. So these, these TMAs, they had 70 cores and they were on the microscope for about four days for all the, for all the cycles and images. It also depends on how many C slides, C slices you wanna do, et cetera. So uh, this, this field of view I showed you, this was a 0 0.6 millimeter core size. So this is the smallest core we can do. And um, we, we have some upgrades now. We can do more than 100 cores into a codex uh, TMA right now. But at the time we did this, we could only do 70. And um, this is a very good question. We are now for the cor coronavirus project, we are actually making bigger cores because the lung um, the lung is much less dense, right? So we, we need more tissue to get the number of the reasonable number of cells. So we're now doing uh, 1.5 millimeter cores. But to mitigate this, this um, representation issue, we basically took four different regions of the infiltrate at the tumor invasive front per patient. So then we, we, have, we are quite confident that we, we nicely represent, we, but we're only interested in uh, in the immune infiltrate and not the, the tumor itself. So we only wanted to focus on this. Um, we can also do whole sections, but it's, it's much more time consuming and you can only do one at once, right? Whereas with the TMA, we can do 50 patients or, or 30 patients in one go. So that's, that's, it's, always a, it's always finding the balance between heterogeneity. And then in the end, we are looking at four microns of a five centimeter tumor, right? So it's always, yeah. Always difficult. Good. And then uh, there was this discussion about codex and Vectra, but so you're, you suggest in your presentation that they'll be complementary to each other? 
Yes, exactly. So in my in my mind, um, Codex is basically more a discovery platform. And if you want to do large scale validation, if you you use Codex to discover a biomarker, for example, or 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 a, a signature in a tissue, and then you 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 basically narrow this 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 marker panel down to seven markers that are sufficient to recapitulate this finding in Vectra. And then you do large scale Vectra with, with hundreds of patients and full slides. Then you have much, much more data. Interesting. And then we haven't heard much about like deep learning. Typically people keep using deep learning in many different projects, right? Is there any plan for deep learning in spatial mapping of these diseases? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm working with a, a company actually, <clears throat> and this could be maybe be interesting for your next seminar series. Um, Aaron Meyer, and uh, you, I think you know him, Stefan Robala. He, yeah. He's uh, in uh, Sam Gambier's radiology uh, department, yeah. mm -hmm. radiology. You were there as well. You, you have uh, with, with Stefan Harms, and you even co published, right? So uh, with them, we're doing a, a project on uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And Aaron Meyer, they, they recently founded a company called Enable Medicine. And um, they, they are actually doing codex uh, on a, on a um, CRO basis. So they're working with pharma and they're analyzing samples for pharma, et cetera. Okay. So it could be interesting. I, I, can, I, I can put you in contact with, uh, with yeah. the CEO or with Aaron if, you, if you're interested. They can also make a presentation. They have they have nice um, they have neural network stuff. They have deep learning stuff going on uh, with with Codex data, and it, it's actually really powerful. And they have great great visualization tools and stuff. They're building this company from scratch, and it, it's looking very good. Yeah, you would so, be happy to have have them for here as a speaker here. And yeah, then... I will. I will send you an email after the talk. Uh, connect you to the to the CEO of the company, and they're very nice guys, and they're excellent. I work with them, and you know, you probably know them. Um, they're really good. Nice. Sounds good. And any final questions? I'll give you another thirty seconds. Okay. If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, thank you. It was a great pleasure for me to be here. And before I conclude, also I will ask: uh, Is it okay to post this video online to YouTube? Absolutely, I'm totally yeah. okay with that. Yeah, perfect. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you everybody. And uh, we have again next week a seminar from Cornell, and it will be also special imaging. And we look forward to see you. And uh, for now, have a nice weekend. I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.